Next up though, we have a panel, um, and our panel is gonna be on the intersection of open hardware and health tech. Um, we have a bunch of exciting panelists. Um, we have Robert Fusier and Benajer Fali on um, open source hardware for hospital practices. We have Samuel McDermott on open source hardware for blood smearing devices. We have Robert L. Reed on um, open source hardware for respiratory support devices. And we have our own amazing Claire Cassidy, um, who is our open, horror, our open hardware summit talks chair um, to moderate the panel. Um, so thanks so much for joining us, everyone. And uh, good luck on the panel. Am I? Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I was just saying that it's been a long day. And um, thank you, Nadia, for holding down the fort and doing an incredible job. And we are here trying to do a big, exciting panel for you all as the end of the day kind of celebration. Um, and how we've organized this is we noticed that probably due to you know, gestures broadly, there's several very incredible health projects in open source happening right now. So we wanted to gather those people together and see what happens. Um, each of them will, will be speaking individually. And so you'll get to hear about their projects, but then at the end, we will be taking projects generally and they can chat with each other. And of course you can chat in Discord um, during and after. So first up, we have uh, Bernier and Robert, and apologies, I didn't take French. I probably butchered that. <laughs> but their project is called Long-Term Benefits. Um, what long-term benefits can the health sector take from projects developed in open hardware to face the health crisis? So they'll be talking to you about that. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Well, uh, hi everyone. Um, thanks a lot to the Open Source Hardware Association for giving us the opportunity to present the results uh, of our research work. So it's about the projects developing open hardware to face the COVID-19 health crisis and um, what can the health sector actually learn from these projects to face a future crisis. So this research um, is part of the Fabrique RF project. It's operated uh, between France and the French and Dutch speaking parts of Belgium with the subsidies of the European Commission's Intrac program. So the project aims at um, developing new technologies, making it possible to copy in 3D any metal structure at low cost. So our research focuses uh, on the territory's adoption potential for small scale manufacturing technologies, uh, the, also the exploitation of open source and open hardware practices, and the organization of the ecosystems around these practices. Um, so this is what actually led us uh, to analyze the projects developed in open hardware by French and Belgian makers during the COVID-19 health crisis. So I worked on this research uh, with Robert Wieser, and he's a um, doctor and associate professor at the University of Mons uh, in Belgium. So um, in terms of context, well, we are, uh, um, so can you, I can share my slide now? Yeah, okay. Okay, so um, as I was saying, well, and as other uh, presenters uh, explained earlier, so back uh, in March 2020, uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic led to the confinement of populations worldwide, well, um, it, it also led to shortages of medical equipment, such as uh, face shields, accessories like uh, syringe pumps, for example, and also more complex medical equipment, such as respirators. Um, the makers, uh, therefore, they mobilized worldwide using open source technologies to produce this medical equipment from 3D printable uh, personal protective equipment to more complex open hardware devices, uh, actually often retro engineered. So the makers, they actually tried to fill the need as best as they could. And these makers, they structured in, uh, in collective and communities, and they set up alternative local production uh, capacities. 
They also produced a reusable, mostly open source, digital commons at international level and allowing makers to share knowledge and uh, optimize those developments. So beyond this one-time uh, nature of the response, this mobilization has um, activated transdisciplinary networks of local actors where Fab Labs played their a key role. So these makers, they coordinate... Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. We actually... Apologies, it took us a minute yeah. to catch on. Um, we okay. actually can't see your slides now. There we go. And so um, actually, so as I was saying, the, um, the makers, they coordinated through the digital platforms to communicate and collaborate. And uh, they exchanged the open source design and the best practices through uh, those digital platform. And um, in our research, uh, we actually um, refer to, um, you know, the, the how the makers, they, they organized to actually, um, well, uh, work through uh, this um, development of uh, uh, medical equipment. So um, our research focuses on the coordination mechanism, uh, the digital tools and the different types of makers actually mobilized during uh, the first wave of the pandemic to clarify how they activated uh, transdisciplinary networks of local actors, including fab labs, to share design and knowledge and optimize medical equipment developments in open hardware. So research is um, linked and in line with the Open Hardware Summit's uh, thematics as we address the open hardware applications and practices, the role of open hardware in medical device production, and also the use of open source uh, to face unforeseen events and come out of it uh, stronger. So when it comes to the state of the art, we refer to the makers movement popularized by Anderson. Um, an important reference in um, what we uh, do is the article published by Robert and Amel Charleux in Terminal uh, about the makers production of those uh, personal protective equipment. And um, the, the third place is um, such as Fab Labs, uh, also often played a central key role in these uh, productions. And here we are referring to Coende with a structure of three levels articulating from the top large uh, organizations. That is the upper ground. I'll come to that uh, later. Then in the middle, uh, the Fab Labs, that is the middle ground. And then uh, the makers at the bottom level, that is the underground. And they use digital platform, allowing the centralization of knowledge produced. And this all takes place in the same innovative uh, open source appropriate technology mindset detailed by uh, Joshua Pierce papers. Um, it is about improvising um, ingenious solutions uh, for, well, under adverse uh, uh, situation, crisis, etc. And I'm referring here uh, to the frugal type of engineering using digital at the strict minimum, uh, that is low tech, uh, easily reproducible, uh, that is open source, and universal in scope and non-commercial uh, in purpose. So our methodology, um, we actually um, used a qualitative approach. Um, it is uh, structured in three uh, complet complementary steps. So first, we observed uh, the mobilized makers in France and Belgium. Then uh, we analyzed um, the digital platforms they used, uh, for example, Riot in France and uh, Slack uh, in Belgium. Uh, we focused on the textual content of the online discussions rooms uh, they, they, they shared, and we extracted content and coded it uh, to identify the most active persons to interviews. And so our third step consisted in interviewing these most active makers identified. They were either a part of fab labs, of hospitals, uh, businesses, and with technical or non-technical profiles. So uh, these makers communities, uh, they used uh, technologies and technological platforms to communicate through website and social network, um, also to share developments through messaging systems and to make knowledge available through a storage tool such as a GitHub or a GitLab, for example. 
So here um, you can see that these platforms, they, um, they make it possible to actually compensate for the reduction of face-to-face -face, uh, contacts and to structure locally produced knowledge uh, such, such as uh, the sharing of designs. Um, but also on the basis of uh, designs proposed by more global plat platform. You can see them here on the uh, left hand side. So um, it's uh, the case, for example, with uh, the uh, 3D printing companies such as Prisa Research or Dagoma or the MIT um, uh, designs. Those were also uh, used uh, by makers uh, around the world and shared through platforms. So these platforms, they have allowed often at the initiative of core teams um, or animated by leaders or uh, at, in fab labs or makers uh, by themselves. And um, this uh, allowed the distributed production um, uh, at the underground, as I was explaining earlier. So you have uh, uh, citizens, students, uh, pure what we call pure makers. And those, um, the, the, the link with the institutional partners um, that are here uh, showed as the upper ground, uh, gathering um, hospitals, researcher, industries, um, the, the, the work between them was uh, facilitated by the fab labs that you can see here in the middle ground. And the whole ecosystem uh, functioning was key to successful open source equipment prototyping and production, and mainly um, to face also constraints such as uh, homologations, uh, technical constraints, uh, etc. So for more complex devices, such as respirators, the design choices benefited uh, on the one hand from pre-existing open source designs, and also on the other hand uh, from the retro-engineering of com commercialized machines. So they didn't uh, start from scratch. The objective was uh, to propose a good enough product with um, that would be inexpensive, simple, easy to produce locally, and also um, most important, repairable. With um, and also while they can uh, preserve uh, the the patient's uh, safety. So the projects we studied um, of varying complexity and maturity, they, pro they provide uh, insights on the best practices to reach uh, that uh, level of development. So for simple equipment, the makers and the, the fab labs, they uh, contribute to the resilience of territories by rapidly providing a distributed production capacity in the case of crisis. Uh, however, um, you have to be um, aware that their mobilization they assumes the existence of a network of digital manufacturing third places, such as Fab Labs, as I was explaining earlier. And those um, are well established locally. Their um, activation when the risk of shortage has been anticipated and also the pre-existence of digital collaborative platforms, because you could see like the, uh, we uh, showed the importance, uh, the important role of the platforms. So for complex equipment, makers and fab lab, they could in the long term bring a simplified designs that could be uh, produced locally. So um, this also presupposes that um, sufficient expertise to make the right technical choice, uh, also um, project management capabilities, um, and um, the application of standards um, are uh, taken into account. And um, in a crisis situation, um, it's um, also um, important to be uh, relying, to be able to rely on local production capabilities. For example, um, we have seen uh, over here in Europe the Trinity printer farms and um, also um, local um, disinfection capabilities uh, for reuse. So, the um, like. For us, we think that um, the low-tech approach requires the availability of, uh, as I said, uh, different expertise. So uh, engineers, uh, makers, researchers, industrials, um, lawyers, um, and this means multidisciplinary multidisciplinarity in terms of project management, functional constraints, and engineering. 
of health, then the constraints uh, imposed by the medical context will not be met. Um, that's where we saw um, unsuc unsuccessful projects um, um, with the, the, the respirators, for example. So um, in addition to the machines themselves, the, um, the supply tensions um, observed here and there, they have also led to a sustained reflection of the life cycle of consumables. So um, we are um, asking, so should we continue to purchase disposable accessories or um, should we um, develop local production capacities such as the 3D printing machines at the hospitals, for example, or invest in um, disinfection capacities that will extend the life uh, of accessories while uh, respecting hygiene standards. So we think that open source practices should be addressed for the environmental impact and for the resilience offered in the event of a major uh, logical disruption uh, due to crisis. And this would probably happen again, and we should learn from that. OK. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Am I correct to think that, um, thank you. <laughs> that that's that's going to be your talk? Robert is here as, as backup, right? Yeah, and he will uh, answer questions. Uh, Perfect. If we have afterwards, yeah. And sorry, okay. I, I'm losing my voice a bit. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's the end of a long day. I think we all understand. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I do have a question from Discord, which is that medical devices are regulated differently all over the world. Um, can you share ways that hardware makers can learn more about what to expect with regulation or talk about regulation generally? Well, relation, regulation has been the, the biggest uh, concern to address uh, because there are actually different types of regulations. There are the, the regulations that um, the, the medical sector um, just uh, gives, but there are also a regulation like in the, the case of the COVID-19 crisis, um, the, the, there were things that were allowed by the governments, for example, like makers uh, could uh, produce uh, face shields. But at one point, like in France, uh, they decided like to to stop that because they considered it was uh, too uh, um, well too too dangerous. Like if uh, people using it would uh, complain uh, after uh, towards the makers, and and there were really different um, situations um, that we encountered between countries and also um, different like for example in um, countries like uh, Spain or the UK or even uh, in France for respirators where when the government was um, involved in the makers uh, mobilization they were helping out and they were um, helping with the test and with the validation of the, 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 the medical equipment so that was easier but um, on a regular basis, a lot of makers, they explain to us that it would not be possible because by the time like um, they, they, they have to, to do the test, they find the money to actually do it. It's really complicated. So, so there's a need for a change of mentality also in the way that, you know, um, open source and open hardware medical equipment uh, should be developed with the help of the, the, the actual um, uh, people who do make the regulations. And um, the, we, we have the testimonies of uh, different makers um, who did um, send the devices they produced uh, to um, uh, the, uh, Country, underdeveloped countries, like for example, they went, uh, they sent some to Brazil, uh, they sent uh, some to India, because at one point, like in, uh, at least well in Europe, uh, we didn't have this, um, the, the, the problem of um, a lack of respirator anymore. So um, the, the makers, they, they, they saw that in other countries they still needed it, so they send them out. And there, there's no, this, there are not the same uh, rules. And those uh, devices, they were actually used 
and saved lives. So there's, it, it's it's really um, uh, something that is um, quite uh, difficult to discuss because there's a lot of um, ethical uh, things with that. There's a lot of um, also, you know, like if you if you provide a face shield to someone, well, that there's less chance that that person would be killed that if you put a respirator on that person and if it doesn't work then it, it's the, 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 it's there's a lot of difference between the the level of device um the, the, that that you are producing in the medical sector um they are well in europe i would say they they are not really ready yet for for they do testing and they help uh, with innovation, but there are still really strict rules uh, in terms of uh, um, homologation and testing, and and it costs a lot of money, and and that's still um, the, the this COVID nineteen crisis help uh, war well make people aware of this, but it I mean it hasn't. Bernier, you've um, frozen. Like, Sorry. No. You, oh. um, so we didn't catch the last little bit of that, but we no, no, no. That, we got the message yeah. for the most part. Yeah, OK. Great. Yeah, and, and thank you. That's an extremely thorough and useful answer. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to move on to the next speaker, but I'm going to save some of the questions that we got here, and we can try to pull them back in at the end. How's that sound? Good? Good. So. Next up, we have Samuel with Autoheim, automating blood smearing with open source hardware. Hello, thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed today so far. So um, I'm going to talk a bit today about the project I've been working on for the last year. So yes, I'm Samuel McDermott. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Physics. And uh, we've been developing ways to automate uh, blood smearing using open source hardware. So the context for this project has been within the field of uh, malaria diagnosis. Um, so this is a pandemic that obviously has existed for a very long time. It's still a very deadly disease, um, increasingly deadly at the moment uh, due to a whole variety of factors. Um, but uh, we've been looking at ways that we can uh, improve one aspect of this, which is uh, automating the diagnosis of the malaria. So the problem is I've been working on the Open Flexure project for the last three years. In this project, we've been automating the diagnosis of malaria with this low cost smart microscope. So this is a 3D printed open source microscope. And as part of this project, I identified that actually one of the many of the manual blood smears from clinics that we were getting in Tanzania were particularly poor quality. And with all of these type of automation things, you have uh, poor quality in, you're going to get poor quality out. And it turns out that it's not possible to automate malaria diagnosis with poor quality blood smears. In fact, this isn't even particularly unique to Tanzania. In some countries, up to 80% of uh, blood smears are prepared incorrectly. But to understand a little bit more about this, it'd be useful to talk about what is malaria or how is malaria diagnosed. So a patient would typically present with a fever to a clinic. They would then have a microscopic examination of a patient's blood smear. So this is uh, normally uh, the best way of diagnosing malaria. There are rapid diagnostic tests, but microscopic examination is the gold standard. From the microscopic examination, you can identify a whole load of factors. So you can identify the species of malaria, the stage of malaria, and the density of the infection. And all of this information combined will help Correct, give the correct treatment. Now in this stage here of microscopic examination, there are a few kind of smaller steps. So we'll examine them now. Firstly, you need to prepare the slide. So you just need to clean it, dry it. We want to collect a few drops of blood and we will create a few different types of smears. So at the moment, we're interested in this thin smear here. And I'll show you what we are looking at in a thin smear later on. It's then uh, fixed with methanol, stained, and then you can identify the parasites under the microscope. So for many of you, you may not have seen what a, a malaria parasite looks like. This is some stained uh, blood. These are just red blood cells in the blue, 
and you can see these purple ones here. These are the malaria parasites themselves. So a technician will be able to see how many parasites there are in a person's blood and also identify what stage they are. So some of these are in different shapes and they correspond to the different stages of the parasite's life cycle. Now, when we want to create these blood smears to be able to look at them, there are commercial solutions available. And quite often in larger hospitals in, uh, in richer countries, this is how this is done. However, they're too expensive for use in uh, low and middle income countries. And also they tend not to be available either. Um, so uh, it's very difficult to uh, buy them. It's very difficult to service them. It's very difficult to uh, kind of maintain them on an ongoing basis. So they're just not found where they're most needed. They also tend to be unsustainable. Um, they require quite often custom use single plastics that you use once, chuck away. And so they, they're not a really uh, useful solution. And so our project has been aiming, uh, or the Autoheme has been aiming to make this high quality automated blood smearing available everywhere. So we use a whole load of uh, important parts to make that happen. So we're using open collaboration technologies and 3D printing, and this will enable us to enable local manufacturing and to keep costs down. Um, so what makes a good thin blood smear? So firstly, we want a nice mono layer of these red blood cells. So here you can see in this image, this is a really nice one where none of them are overlapping. We also want a Goldilocks density. So we don't want them too crammed in together, but we also don't want them so spread apart that you have to look through so many fields of view to be able to see them. And we want a nice even distribution. So we don't want them all squished together in one corner and all spread out in the other power. And finally, we want to make sure that these red blood cells are not damaged or, or distorted. So this is the kind of traditional way that you would make a blood smear. So here we have our drop of blood. We have one microscope slide here and one microscope slide here. And we're able to change the angle and the speed in which we move this uh, spot of blood. So here I am in the lab. Uh, so we place a drop of blood on our microscope slide. And then we create a thin smear. So we pull back and we push forward. And then we created a nice thin th smear. Now, this is OK when you're in a nice clean lab. You only need to make a handful of them a day. But if you're working in somewhere where you're very pressured to make lots of blood smears, you have a large number of backlogs, you've got to get them out quickly, you're working in particularly cramped, dirty, dark environments, then it's very difficult to keep maintaining a high consistency in the quality of your smears. And so our kind of solution to these is two devices. So firstly, we have this device here. This is the autoheme smear device. And firstly, it's important to notice that it's just a mechanical device. So there's no electricity required. And this is particularly important for use in rural clinics where there may be an interruptible power supply or no power supply at all. Next, uh, we want to make sure that it's simple to assemble and maintain. So we're using kind of uh, off-the-shelf components where we can, uh, 3D printing, um, and we want to make sure that it's easy to clean and so on. Next, we want to make sure that we are being sustainable in our single-use components. So in this example, we're using a second microscope slide as our spreader rather than a single-use plastic. These can be reused, cleaned, and these are common in the facilities that we would be working in. Finally, there's one controlled variable in this setup, and that is that the spreader slide is held at a constant angle through here. Um, so this is how it looks all together. So we can see taking it apart, there's not a huge number of components in this one, and we can see that the spreader slide fits in here. Now this is this device in operation. So again, we follow a very similar procedure, so it's not a huge lot of learning curve. We place a drop of blood on our slide, we place our slide in the top, pull back, and just push forward. And that means for every single slide that a person is doing, it's going to be held at the same angle, which is really important. Our second device is Autoheme Smear Plus. Now, this is an electronic device. Um, it has um, a kind of electrical and mechanical component. So, but it's kind of low power, so you'd be able to power it off of, of a, of a a power bank or something like this. It's powered by Arduino underneath and it has this NEMA 17 stepper motor. And 
This is the easiest way to make high throughput smears, um, as you just need to press the button and it's going to perform exactly the same repetitive smear motion every time. In this example, we can control the two variables, so we can make sure that our slide is held at a constant angle, and we can also make sure that it moves at a constant speed. And here it is uh, to be put together. So it's a little bit more complicated, um, but at the core of it is an Arduino Uno, and we have our NEMA stepper motor, and of course, all of the body is 3D printed as well. So to operate this one, we just place a drop of blood in exactly the same way. We put a glass slide in the top, push the button, and it performs the slide for you. So a technician is able to make many slides simultaneously, increasing their throughput, but also making sure that the slide is the same every single time. So we're going to end up with nice, consistent smears. So we perform some automated smear analysis on this using some uh, machine learning uh, image analysis techniques. So we can identify where the uh, blood cells are on the smears and so on. Um, and we can show for both the autoheme smear and the autoheme smear plus that we're able to get smears as good as a expert human, but importantly with consistency. If you want some more details about the kind of uh, techniques that we use to, uh, to test the devices, I will point you towards our, our paper that's published here. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the design considerations. So firstly, it's 3D printed. This is because in uh, low and middle income countries, 3D printing is becoming an important manufacturing uh, device. You don't need a huge uh, factory setup to be able to create things. Um, we also want to make it easy to assemble so it can be assembled with simple hand tools. We're using accessible and sustainable components so that ties into the uh, kind of mechanical hardware, the electronics, and also using the glass slides as the smearer as well. And finally, we want to make it easy to use. So we don't want a complicated interface or things. We wanted to make it as, as easy as possible for people. Um, so our software choices, uh, all of our 3D designs are made in OpenSCAD. Um, the Arduino code, of course, is, is open source as well. Uh, we've used uh, Git and GitLab uh, to maintain uh, version control. We've also used GitLab for a lot of automated CI and CD tools. So this means that the uh, STL files are built automatically. Uh, so whenever we push new releases, they're built automatically. And that also ties into our documentation, which is also built in our CI. And for our image analysis, we've used open source image analysis tools. So documentation is very important. Um, we have been designing our documentation for people who don't usually make hardware. So this will be people working in research labs, in universities, in research clinics. Um, we use our GitLab CI and CD, so this is continuous integration, continuous development, to automatically build our documentation. So we use this technology that's been built by a colleague of mine called Git Building, and this ties in very nicely with GitLab's automated building tools. And this makes it really easy to download models from there and to automatically create a bill of materials. All right, um, um, Samuel, I'm going to pause you mm -hmm. real quick. Um, we actually need to move on to the next speaker to stay on time. And yep. if you're I'm on my very last slide. So. <laughs> watch, watch. Truly, I love it. I really don't want to stop you. But it does feel like we can share documentation in, in Discord, yeah? Yep. Yeah. That's okay, great. that works for you. Thank you, very Thank much. you so much. Um, and I'm going to move us along to Robert Reed, and then we will take questions. And if anybody has a burning question for Samuel that didn't get addressed, please drop it in Discord, and I'll make sure to ask it. And thank you, Samuel. OK, Robert. So uh, thank you very much. This is really exciting. I'm going to speak very, very quickly so that um, we can get to the questions, because I think there are very interesting questions. And, and I certainly have questions for our, our other speakers uh, who have done very exciting uh, work. Um, I'm the founder of Public Invention, which is a US 501c3 uh, um, uh, charity. Um, we make a lot of uh, projects or ideas to invent in the public for the public. So you can think of us as just taking free Libre open source software ideas and applying them to open source hardware with a focus on inventions. And inventions are, are things that you would write an academic paper about or get a patent for. But of course, we don't seek patents because everything we're doing is open source. 
Um, we've created some health things, but what I want to talk mention here is the Free Spirico Manifesto. Which Free Spirico is a project to create an ecosystem for certain kinds of medical devices around medical gases, meaning ventilators and, and uh, oxygen concentrators, nebulizers, and, and things like that. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated a clear and present need for complete, free libre, open source, easily repairable, widely usable, safe and effective respiratory support medical device ecosystem. Um, we've created the Open uh, Medical Technology Manifesto. I'd like people to consider signing it. Um, I was informed by someone here that there's a different one that I was unaware of. I hope I haven't duplicated some work that they've done. Um, uh, why can you imagine an ecosystem of these kinds of respiratory devices? Because they all have to control and monitor medical gases very precisely. So what ties all these together from a technological point of view is that all of them have to deal with air controlled in terms of flow, pressure, and oxygen content in a very precise way. So uh, an oxygen concentrator, a ventilator, a BPAP machine, CPAP machine, PAPR, and a BVM monitor all have those things in common um, tied together by some software and some standards that I don't have time to talk about. Um, an example of this is that every ventilator can be placed on this diagram. And these modules exist in every ventilator. Right now, mechanical ventilators are not produced in an open source way, but they could be, and we're attempting to accomplish that. We have made an open source ventilator. It is not for medical use. I'm, I'm interested in talking about the regulatory issues that were raised in the, the questions here. We, we think of it as an educational open source platform now. It's called the Polyvent uh, System. Um, I want to mention Jake Reed, who has no relation to me that I'm aware of. Um, he talked about a modular architecture in his talk. We're doing the same thing. Uh, uh, he was using um, RS-485 to create um, a 3D printing CNC mill machine, which was extremely modular. Spirico is an attempt to do the same thing, but applied to the realm of mechanical ventilation and, and medical gases. Um, so how realistic is this? We are making some progress. Um, uh, we can take the slides down now. That's the, the end of my talk. Um, but I just wanted to show this is the Ventmon device, which we made. This is a standard 22 millimeter uh, airway. Um, it has a little bitty screen, but really it's a Wi-Fi enabled monitor of flow and pressure at human breathing pressures, which is tied to a data lake which draws the kinds of graphs that doctors normally clinically see uh, live um, when you plug it in between either a test lung and a mechanical ventilator for the purpose of testing it, or eventually a human patient. This is not an FDA approved device at the moment um, for that purpose. So, that, so this works and was given, um, I got a couple grants, uh, to, I gave 30 of these away to the kinds of engineering teams that um, Mr. Vissour and Ms. Fowley um, studied in their, uh, in their work, um, and not all of them were used, I have to say. It's kind of sad. Some of them just took it and put it on the shelf, but six of them used it really, really effectively, and it was a very, very important part of what they did. So um, uh, I think addressing some of these questions and having conversations more valuable than me going on. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Claire. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was really wonderfully done. Um, your projects are fascinating. So what we're going to do now is we're going to open it up a little bit. Um, and I'm going to start with a question that uh, Robert Reed actually asked of um, Robert Vizur and Ben Bernier. And um, it's how many of your projects are still in operation and how many are successful? There were emergency use author authorizations by the US FDA. Um, do you know much about that? And you can chat among yourselves. You are all free to talk. The, the emergency use authorization was a comment, not a question. <laughs> Actually, um, from the different um, respirators we uh, looked at, um, in France, there's one that's, that's called uh, Macaire. Uh, that has uh, been developed uh, in uh, the area of Nantes in France um, by um, uh, like a, a 
maker, engineer, a uh, businessman uh, profile, and he partnered with um, different uh, industries, with the military um, um, well, government, uh, with um, a lot of uh, makers' profiles and, and different um, universities, researchers, and hospitals. And he actually um, worked a bit differently than the people who did just uh, use the design by the MIT that was maybe um, interesting, but that was um, not uh, really useful for um, for patient and that was a bit dangerous. So uh, this um, project uh, that was successful, um, we what we noticed comparing to other projects is that um, it's uh, that ecosystem that worked really well uh, with collaborations and uh, to, to actually develop something that was uh, working and they had the good contacts to make it uh, approved by the government rapidly and uh, tested uh, on, uh, on people and uh, to them, it actually took too long compared to the crisis situation, but at least it was successful. So, Awesome. Um, okay, I have a next question that I, I think this even leads into, which is um, generally for each of you, what systems do you have in place for quality control? It's an issue that we've seen come up several times today. Who's going to be brave? <laughs> Are you going to pick someone to go first? Mm -mm, it's it's a free floor. Okay. Okay. It's well, like chaos. if you yep. do that, I'll talk too much, Claire. So you may have to. You may have I, to. Um, I will try. I will so try. The, the Vinmon is a um, quality control device. So in a sense, it's meant to measure the quality of other um, devices. Um, we did extensive calibration testing with just a a, a giant syringe. Uh, you know, on this and, and did um, what I would call redundancy uh, testing. Um, I, but I'd like to respond to some things that are in here. In the end, you can't trust engineers. Uh, although we're very honest people, no one wants, you know, to call their own baby ugly, right? So the, the problem is you can't trust engineers to evaluate their own equipment. And so what we really need is an open source mechanism of third party testing right that's the i think the the real solution to this problem is that you know i claim this is a good monitor of flow and pressure and someone else should test it and say yes it is it, it does what it says it does samuel what do you think i think um it kind of comes down to two parts. So firstly, you have to have the, the quality control of your designs, but you also have to have it for your manufacturers. So if you are looking for a kind of distributed model that potentially would work for us, how do you make sure that people who are manufacturing it around the world are manufacturing it to the correct standards? And I think that's a, a question that has not been answered uh, uh, completely yet. But I think it's something that we should be thinking about. Um, so let me respond to that. Um, so speaking only for the U.S., and I'm not a U.S. Uh, chauvinist, I just happen to know about the FDA regu regulation. You know, they do not uh, validate a design. They validate a design in combination with a manufacturing plan, and you're not allowed to deviate from that manufacturing plan plant. And so if you are making a, you know, a class one or class two regulated device uh, that has to be manufactured in that way, you just have to use a completely different model. Um, now, I personally am not attempting to subvert the um, regulatory regimes. Okay. Of course, what the U.S. does does not have to be followed in any other nation. So some low and middle income country can do can do whatever they want, but they're probably going to have their own regulatory regime, which must be which must be followed. I believe that the open source community, even though the level of documentation and care that is required for medical regulation is onerous for the mindset of a hacker like me, 
needs to step up and start doing it. And we need an educational system where we can teach ourselves how to how to get this kind of regulatory stuff. So I don't think it's I don't think our approach should be, oh, we need to figure out a way around the regulation. We need to figure out a way to conform to the regulatory bodies. Hmm. Okay. Awesome thoughts. Um, I'm going to do another question and then I'm going to kick it off with Bernier and uh, Robert Vizur. I'm not sure if you feel like speaking on the stream, but you're welcome to try. Um, so the question is, do maker medical devices compete with or complement traditional proprietary devices? And I, I know this is a bit of a large question that's on purpose. Uh, I would not say that it's a competition, but it's just that um, the, what happens, uh, well, what we um, analyzed with the different projects, uh, we, we interviewed people that were um, prototyping and developing them, is that um, they, they acted in a crisis situation. But by doing so, they showed what the problem is right now, like in the medical sector, is that a lot of uh, devices and a lot of uh, equipment is something that is, well, not locally produced. It's something that um, is uh, always, well, most of the time uh, very expensive or it's not uh, repairable. It's not. And so, um, well, working open source shows that um, things can be produced um, a, a lot more simpler, can be uh, fixed uh, on site and does not need to be sent uh, somewhere else and, and is not uh, that expensive. So it's just that um, it could help with the actual um, uh, challenges we are going to face with the environment, with the, the medical uh, expenses, with the, the waste and all that. So it's 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 a way also that um, what we we explained tonight is the importance of sharing design, of sharing knowledge, and that will also would also save a lot of money, a lot of difficulties to 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 produce things locally. To and I think it's just a different way of thinking, but the um, actual way uh, the the economic system is functioning, it's. I don't think they are ready for that. Like we talk to people working uh, in hospitals and stuff, and and they 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 would like to 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 go for this, but like in hospitals, they are not ready. Like uh, well, when it comes to spendings and uh, um, contracts they have got and uh, regulations and things like that. So absolutely i think you're speaking to the right crowd um a thing i'm fond of dissecting sometimes is an abundance model versus a scarcity model right and i think that comes into play here um so i'm going to ask one more question and i'm going to start off with samuel if you're okay with that um and then we can open it up to whoever feels like talking um so the question is can you imagine that open hardware could raise safety standards in health technology even in the not so distant future? Is it helping move that along? I think that's a, a difficult question. It's kind of a, a crystal ball type question, isn't it? Um, I think what open hardware can do is it can enable more people to address these problems um, by uh, making them more accessible. So, for example, one thing that we're really trying to push with our blood smearing devices is that if you, and, and this applies across the board as well, if you create devices that people can make themselves, people can use, people can make relatively cheaply, then you're going to up the reproducibility that we see in science. So if people are able to uh, perform experiments using the same equipment that someone else has done, and you can show how you made the equipment, how you put it all together, and you can copy that exactly, then the reproducibility in silence is gonna increase as well. Absolutely, yeah. Anybody else have thoughts? Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, I don't want my mom ventilated with a closed source ventilator, but I have no choice right now, right? I mean, I I would like the whole world to be able to see the software that is running there, but it, but it's, it's not possible. I, I believe long-term, 
open source medical devices will be safer. But it's very important to understand the model will be open source design teams produce open source designs and for-profit firms take those designs, go through regulation and deliver them in a for-profit way. Okay, so it, it it's, it's kind of important to understand the model is not like people like me working in our basements, you know, making medical devices. What we may do is contribute to designs which be eventually are vetted by for-profit firms. But though those designs may be taken up by very large medical firms eventually, they will resist it at first. And eventually we will have open source ecosystems of those designs. And I would just add, like in the health sector, there is not only um, well question about like the, the device and things that are um, actually used on patients, but there's also the waste uh, treatment and things like that. And I think that's um, maybe um, less. Um, um, it's asking less regulations, and they could start with that, with like the the way they they they, they uh, clean some uh, disposals, or and that could be reused instead of uh, thrown away, or and well, um, find out like how um open source uh, practices can help out and then go further on things that they can validate and and well after um, a while that could be that could be more um open there, there could be more open source practices uh, done uh, in hospitals uh, and in 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 other uh, sectors of the, the the health sector actually so Nice, lovely. That's very smart goal oriented, right? Small, measurable, um, move, go from there. Okay, um, that is our time. There is a channel in Discord that you can talk to all of the audience members and they can talk to you. I think you all know where to find that. And honestly, this has been such an honor and so lovely. This is the first panel I've ever moderated, especially for the Open Hardware Summit. So thank you all so much. You were very lovely and I learned a lot.